Hello, everybody, and very welcome. Uh, my name is Feriel Hafji. I'm with the Daily Maverick. We're with you on a wonderful Future Growth sponsored webinar today, looking at a big, big question. What might a post-COVID economy look like and what is the potential of this moment? So I thought before I get there, I might tell you about things that I'm just seeing that may uh, resonate with you. So this morning I was walking along my road and I was really, and it's a street with a lot of shops and cafes, and the pace at which they had been emptying out was quite shocking to me. In one block, almost four shops gone, didn't make it through the fire. And these are all small businesses, each I'm sure is a wonderful story to tell. Then yesterday, I WhatsApped with a friend of mine, and she tells me that her husband is in a very deep depression because he has to lay off people. And then another friend messaged to say that he's on his third section 189. Now, a section 189 is when you have to lay off people. And that was just yesterday. So I'm sure that you all know of stories like these of millions of jobs lost and an economy tunneling into what is likely our uh, first democratic era depression, but really a, such a deep recession, we haven't seen anything like it before. But I don't want to be a complete downer. So before I introduce you to our wonderful guests, I'd like to say that we um, devote this webinar to our colleague, Gerald Schreiner of the Daily Maverick, who passed away last week. And the reason we do so is that he was very much worked with um, our colleagues. I'll be introducing you to you um, to tell us to, to formulate today's discussions. And we think of him with great love. So I thought I might start, and sorry for those of you who've been on before, with that fabulous quote from Arundhati Roy, whose essay in the Financial Times has, for me, really become like the Magna Carta or the guiding document for how we may think about uh, this time. And she wrote, whatever it is, coronavirus had ma has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to a halt like nothing else could. Our minds are still racing back and forth, looking for a return to normality and trying to stitch our future to our past and refusing to acknowledge the rupture. But the rupture exists. And in the midst of this terrible despair, it offers us a chance to rethink the doomsday machine we've built for ourselves. Nothing could be worse than a return to normality. So two leaders who do think that this pandemic is a portal to a better world, join us today. Taryn Sanko, welcome. Taryn is the head of listed growth at the asset manager, Future Growth. And Nicole Martins is the head of Africa and Middle East at the Principles for Responsible Investing, PRI, which is a UN supported organization of, or one which supports the UN in realizing its global contact. Very welcome, lovely to have you with us today. So, Nicole, I'll start with you. Um, everybody's speaking about this great reset, um, and Arundhati Roy offers, uh, challenges us that things can't go back to how they were. What does that reset look like to you? Well, thanks very much, Meryl, and thanks again to Future Growth and to Daily Maverick for the opportunity to be part of this really important and timely conversation. Um, the Green Reset way that we would see it at PRI, it's really an opportunity to rethink the way that specifically our capital markets are put together, specifically thinking about whether they are fit for purpose. So are we currently structuring our markets? Are we making decisions? Are our economic strategies designed in a way not only that generates you know, excessive financial wealth in return, but that builds the economy, builds the world that we want, that addresses the environmental, the social and the governance uh, objectives of society as a whole. When we look at the Green Reset, what we're seeing in different government policies that are starting to emerge and the discussions that we're having, it's an, a concept of when we're, this, this whole idea of building back better. So not going back to normal, but failing forward, saying, all right, we can do better, we can leapfrog some of the challenges in the path. It's things like making sure that our recovery strategies are sustainable, 
that they're integrating these environmental social objectives, these goals, things like the sustainable development goals, the idea of a just transition towards low carbon economies, which is essentially saying, how do we move from a fossil fuel intensive economy to one that is green, but is also socially and economically sustainable for communities, um, especially ones like ours that are so dependent on fossil fuels. It's about things like it, addressing income inequality and poverty and unemployment in a way that is sustainable in the long term. The idea really being that you know, there are, as much as we've been focused on this endless treadmill of just generating maximum return, there are no returns to be generated on a dead planet or in a community or society where everything is dissolved into chaos because we didn't address these non-financial factors. So the Greens Reset really presents us with an opportunity to say, hey, how do we get not back to where we were, but even beyond that, by creating policy and uh, regulatory environments now, by addressing corporate culture and the purpose of the corporation in a way that is to the benefit of all and leaves no one behind. Thank you very much. I'm sure that you must have seen this week, like, like I was, I really was surprised at that, that Tesla, the electronic car manufacturer, um, has now overtaken Toyota as the most valuable um, motor manufacturer in the world. And I've been reading almost as a sub narrative about how the disinvestment from fossil fuels, harmful fossil fuels has really gained ground in the past few months. It's not as big a story um, as it might have uh, been before because COVID-19 is so all encompassing, but these things um, are beginning to happen. Um, um, to happen. So just to greet, we've uh, been joined by lots of um, guests in our audience today, Oranel, Ernest Blobkamp, Graham Falcon, uh, Roger Aronson, lots of people from outside South Africa as well. Hi, Yusuf Adam, Shonin Proctor, we'll get to your questions. Very welcome, Taryn. Very welcome. Lovely to have you with us. What has the pandemic taught you about economies and markets? And how is this linked to the work you've dedicated your life to, which is investing in the future, which is what Future Growth was formed um, to do? So really what we're seeing is that there's a theme of interconnectedness that really runs across climate change, virus pandemics, and responsible investing. And we see this kind of manifesting on a number of different fronts. And interestingly, kind of living through a pandemic, we experience it quite viscerally. So we see this interconnectedness between human health and planetary health, how encroaching on planet, planetary boundaries, biodiversity loss, and trafficking in, in illegal wildlife actually introduces significant risks to human health. We see it also in the interconnectedness between financial and non-financial risks when what started off as a public health crisis in the form of COVID-19 is really yeah. starting to bear down as a significant economic crisis, as you've outlined. And we also see it in the interconnectedness between corporates and the environmental, social and governance context. And to Nicole's point that you can't make profits on a dead planet. So corporates need the communities that they serve to be healthy in order to make sustainable profits. And so where responsible investing really fits into all of this is by allowing investors to take a lens that's broader than just looking at a narrow lens of profit maximization in the short term or a view of purely maximizing profits for shareholder benefits. But it allows us to actually consider all these financial and non-financial risks and importantly, price for them um, and allocate capital in sustainable ways to these sustainable entities. And uh, Taryn, if I may ask you a follow-up question there, how successful have we been as a country in, in making people understand what's also called this triple bottom line, in making the investment community, which is a very powerful part of our economy, um, invest in, the, in these ways? Um, and do you see that, do you think this is a moment in which to expand that? Or is it a moment of such fear and of a depth of depression that people are really just going back to the bottom line? Or do you think a, a bigger message is being, is being heard? Yeah, so certainly I think from a South African perspective, I mean, our pension fund regulations has a very strong requirement for responsible investing, and many South African institutional managers have signed up to the UNPRI's principles. Um, certainly from a reporting and disclosure perspective, the types of and the quality of financial reports, even though they've been kind of merged in 
controversy and corporate corruption recently, but the concept of integrated thinking and really considering the balance of all stakeholders, not just shareholders, is a concept that has been around in the South African kind of investment lexicon for some years. What we are seeing, certainly from our side, is that with yes. COVID-19, it's an acceleration of these trends that existed pre-COVID. And so we're seeing that actually taking a, a broader view of both financial and non-financial risks become increasingly important when it's no longer appropriate to just consider sustainability of a corporate in and of itself. But really what we're looking for is resilience. How do these corporates actually see themselves through and out of these crises? And understanding the social context, the way that staff are treated, for example, the ability to pivot business models and have huge portions of staff work from home from a governance yes. perspective, risk management, contingency planning, the ability to keep operations functioning in the wake of a global pandemic become increasingly important to actually understanding these risks. So the challenge really is about being responsible funders and managing the short-term immediate needs of the crisis yes. while not losing sight of the long-term objectives and the ultimate future economy that we are looking to build. And so that's the real challenge that we faced with as investment managers now, it's straddling both worlds. Great. Thank you very much. From Paul Edmonds, uh, Nicole, we can take this question. How do we ensure that a green economy doesn't concentrate wealth and power in the same way and or place um, and or places that the current economy does? So not only in our country, but in the world I've been reading and even from places which like the FT organizations like the UK Business Roundtable, the US one as well, who, who, who are speaking a different language. Do you think this kind of that we can break those patterns of, of concentration? Well, I think it's a great question. It's one of the core tenets of this idea of a just transition. And yes. it really comes down to making sure that we have the right policy and regulation in place. Um, at this stage, really, there should be two focus points for policy and regulation when it comes to the transition in general and the recovery from the pandef pandemic specifically. The first one is to make sure that you are creating an environment that catalyzes investment into solutions where they already exist. Yes. So where there's already potential, absolutely, you should be making it easy to invest in that and making it easy to absorb local labor, for example. Make sure that the environment's conducive for that. The second is in investing in the development of solutions where they are needed but don't exist. And that's how you make sure that the power distribution is more even. Because if you aren't investing where there are solutions or investing in developing solutions, what you're doing is you're following the entire time. You're waiting for something to come from somewhere else. And if you're waiting for it to come from an external source, you are going to be subject to the power dynamic that accompanies that. So it's not a, an easy thing to do, but it's something where the collaboration between public sector and private sector becomes so important. You know, the role of investors, as Tara rightly says now, is to start thinking about not just your short, but also your long-term um, outcomes, right? Focusing on not just what is or environmental or social governance factors impact my portfolio, but what is the impact of my investment on the broader society? Because that indirectly affects my investments again. So that sort of means that the natural extension then of responsible investment starts to move into engagement with policymakers and regulators to help catalyze the right kinds of policy and regulatory environment. And part of that is understanding those power dynamics. Um, and so I think, yeah, if you're focusing on investing in solutions and investing in the development of solutions, it helps to mitigate that somewhat. Thank you. Um, Taryn Sanka, for you, the five richest men in America have so far benefited by up to 20% in wealth increase during COVID. So James King saying the entire construct of capitalism and how it's evolved must surely be questioned. Now, I don't, um, I also want to link that to in our notes, you, you made for me a very prescient point. You said um, we have to, it, this ties into the PRI, the principles of responsible investing's point of rapidly evolving our de definition of what a responsible investor is and whether the current financial system, specifically the capital markets, are set up in a way that effectively allows them to deal with such crises which are manifold. They become employment crises, food crises, financial crises. Um, do, do you want to just expand on, on that very interesting interesting point you made in your notes there. Sure. So 
increasingly as responsible investors or pre-COVID, pre um, before coronavirus, we focused quite deeply on understanding a company's sustainability. And so the, the comment that you made around triple bottom line reporting, all of that was well entrenched in the South African kind of investment yes. landscape, and it was being integrated to less or greater extents. What we're finding now, and to Nicole's point about understanding the systems in which your investments operate is that that role for engaging with regulators has become increasingly important. And the questions that we're asking are, how are financial markets set up to be able to withstand physical shocks? Because increasingly that's what we're dealing with, right? We're dealing with virus pandemics or it's fires um, ravaging huge portions of Australia. It's a cyclone as recent as today that was reported in Brazil. And so how do we build systems that are resilient and able to deal with these physical shocks? And so from a debt perspective, certainly, our view is that we need to allow for systems to allow for greater degrees of collaboration and interaction. So one of the interesting kind of elements of the local debt capital market, um, and we saw this play out in the recent kind of land bank default, was that there aren't really mechanisms to get investors around the table and actually make decisions, take collective action um, in very short spaces of time in response to these crises. And so a key part of our role as responsible investors is around lobbying and in advocating with regulators around what sustainable financial markets need to look like to allow investors to respond. But I think more broadly to the question that was raised around the role of capitalism, I think certainly we are going to be seeing the role of government changing. We've seen a change through the course of this pandemic where governments increasingly are playing a larger role in the economy where they provide significant amounts of monetary and fiscal stimulus. And even once the pandemic eventually subsides, it's going to be very difficult for them to rapidly scale back that level of support. Um, and so it starts raising the question, for me at least, around, yes, there's financial markets and sustainability, the role that investors can play in advocating for more resilient financial markets. But what role um, should government be playing in all of this? And what role might government play um, in a post-pandemic world. Um, and certainly the way that we see it is that government is there to create an enabling environment for the types of investments that actually build longer term economic resilience. Um, and so that's really the focus for us is around that enabling environment. So what does it look like? It looks like kind of policy certainty. It looks like policy cohesion. Um, it looks like really good project management skills. Um, it looks like the appropriate government underwrite for the transactions, which as Nicole mentioned, people won't necessarily be enticed to fund. So it's about creating incentives to fund the types of assets that are needed to kind of support growth. I, d I do want to come back to that, remembering mm -hmm. that our president has provided, Sir Ramaphosa has provided certain indicators of how he thinks that road should look, is state-led, state-supported infrastructure development, but we have a very poor history of successful infrastructure development. We can come back to that. I just want to get us through a few questions, very good ones. David Wright, all well and good, Nicole, to transition to the green economy, but how do we achieve this transition in a just manner? Can we avoid a transition without winners from and losers? So just to say hello to Paul Van Duren from uh, from Brussels. David Seif's asking for labels on speakers' pictures. We'll get that done for the next one, I promise. But we'll I, I hope you're quite clear on, on who we are. Um, Nicole, want to have a shot at that one? There are winners and losers. Um, and also in your notes to me, you spoke about the big green deals we we're reading about not only in the EU, but also um, in our own country. Great, thank you so much. And, and thanks everyone for these really terrific questions. I'm catching them on the corner of my eye and it's mm. such a terrific discussion that's going on and I wish we could get to all of them and I hope that we'll get a chance to address at least most of them, um, but keep them coming for sure. So the just transition, absolutely, they are always winners and losers. They are always trade-offs to everything, but the idea behind the transition, it really is the key is in that word just. When we're talking about it being just, we mean it needs to be and we seem to be socioeconomically just. And what that means is really a focus on specifically the people that are currently dependent on the fossil fuel heavy industries and their supply chains. And how do we retrain, redeploy those existing workers to other fields? Um, there's a lot of research happening at the moment looking at, okay, what do you do uh, with someone who's just started working versus with someone who's a few years out from retirement versus all those in the middle um, that might not be as easily retrained? Um, there are a lot of 
private sector entities, especially in the fossil fuel industry that are doing great work on this, that are doing a lot of research into how they might transition themselves as companies so that they don't simply cease to exist, but actually evolve or pivot completely into different fields so that they can keep people going, that they can keep those communities going that depend on them. In terms of the green deals and the policies that we're seeing uh, internationally, one of the things that's really exciting is this idea of inevitable policy response. Essentially, what it boils down to is that as a global community, we have at a national level, at different national levels, made commitments to things like the Paris Agreement on Climate and the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals, where as countries, we've set ourselves specific targets. And um, those are related specifically to carbon emissions or carbon equivalency emissions. And the global stock take, which is taking place in three years from now, um, is looking at the moment the way that the statistics are going and the research is suggesting that when we do that global stock take, we're going to realize that we are so far from where we need to be in order to achieve those targets that the only rational next step will be significant, disruptive and drastic policy and regulatory intervention. And the longer we wait, the more disruptive it will be, the bigger the gap between the winners and the losers. So my argument would be that to get started on the transition, the sooner you do, the better, and it mitigates the, the, the disruption and the impact. But it all starts with understanding where are there already solutions? Where do we need to de uh, design or develop more solutions? And in the you know in South Africa context, because I saw some of the questions coming up there about the energy yeah. mix. Um, in the South African context, it's also about understanding where are their vested interests that need to be looked in the bud. You know, why are we propping up sunset industries when there are sort of new growing industries in which we should actually be investing? So I think um, the just transition will be hard, but it will be if we start early a transition as opposed to an abrupt stop and change, which will be a lot more damaging. I'm not feeling so hopeful, Nicole, because I see that our, our policy documents are fabulous about uh, increasing where we get our energy from. But when you listen to our Minister Gwede Mantashi, actually you're seeing that we are still dabbling in nuclear. Um, there's a lot of talk about clean coal and not really the investments um, in renewable energy. Is this something that concerns you sitting at Future Growth, Taryn, when you're looking for policy certainty? So certainly, certainly we, I mean, the, our track record of execution and implementation does leave a lot to be desired. Um, and that policy coherence is something that's really important to attract long-term capital and long-term investment. Um, so it is, it is certainly a concern. It's something that we monitor very closely. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an it's an element that we that that is really critical to making investments bankable. So when I spoke about that enabling environment, yes. the types of things that we're looking for from government is really around kind of line of sight around how these projects are likely to be rolled out, the project management around them, um, and broader than just kind of the, the energy mix, it's the ability to kind of follow through. So the fact that the renewable energy kind of bid windows have been delayed for so many executive occasions, that's certainly a concern for us. And we would look to see the unblocking of that. Um, but it's something that we continue to work on. And Taryn, if I can stay with you for a moment, I'm not sure if you attended or watched or read about um, the mm -hmm. president's recent infrastructure summit, where it's becoming mm -hmm. clear to me that um, for the second time, an ANC administration is, is very much um, devoted to this idea of infrastructure-led growth. Now, obviously, many places in the world, we can see why this uh, could be something that works. But when I look back at our short recent history, in fact, ESCOM, Transnet, Prasa, Airports Company, all of them tells us how badly wrong infrastructure an infrastructure-led model can go if not well managed. Um, how, how, if this is going to work, what do you, you've sketched for us some ways, but what are the other ways that, what are the principles that might be important to see that happening? So I think one of the key principles is really having uh, kind of really strong legal agreements and legal constructs between the public and the private sector. So public-private participation will be critical in rolling out this. And so a really robust um, set of legal agreements that are very firm on kind of anti-corruption and illegal acts will be an important element of kind of attracting 
um, long-term capital investment. Certainly, risk-adjusted pricing and commercial returns are an important element, um, and it's and it kind of bears mentioning when speaking about responsible investing in sustainability that this is not subsidized finance, and so it's going to be important that these transactions stack up on the merits of of the investment case and that an appropriate risk adjusted return is earned. So for example, the way that the government can kind of play a very meaningful role is to provide that risk underwrite um, in the areas where capital is not easily attracted to. So for example, if you think about a toll road, Certainly, in some cases, the government underwrites the geological risk. So if anything happens to that road because of an earthquake, et cetera, there is government kind of protection for that. Similarly, on the independent power producers, there is a government guaranteed offtake from these renewable energy producers. So government has a, quite a crucial role to play in not only providing the government underwrite and the support, but also holding the highest possible standards of project management and corporate governance and accountability as well. Thank you very much. Um, Nicole, question, how does the JSE award green stars um, to companies? Um, perhaps you could unpack that for us a little bit. Sure. So the JSE, to the best of my knowledge, doesn't have sort of a green star okay. system as such, but there is a, they do work with Fitzy Russell on a sort of socially responsible investment index. Um, and they also... Uh, as part of their role as a regulator, part of the listing requirements, they do push emphasis on integrated reporting and corporate governance according to the King Code thing. So that's how, as one of, as um, uh, Nick Newsom King used to say, as one of the guardians of governance, that's sort of how they help with that. Um, but they, as far as I know, don't have sort of a green star rating, and I'm not sure that that should be uh, their role. Okay, thank you. From Aura now, Taryn, who will re-educate re business and money owners to prepare and motivate them for this change? Is that so what you're trying to do? Yeah. <laughs> so ultimately, it's asset owners, right? It's okay. individuals like you and I that have retirement annuities or pension fund savings that hold managers to a higher level of accountability and really start interrogating where our money is going and asking really hard questions of ourselves as to, are my investments supporting the building of a society that's in alignment with why values? Why or why not? It's calling up your financial advisor or your asset consultant and having the conversations with your asset managers around, how do you think about these issues? How are you responding to the crisis? How is your definition of responsible investing evolving? And, and how are you doing things differently to support these longer term objectives? So the onus really is on us as, as asset owners um, to take ownership of our money and drive this agenda. Mm, thank and you. Can I, I think yes, that's yes. absolutely right. I, I mean, Taryn's point is, is vital because everyone in the investment chain has a really important role to play, especially the end sort of client, because it's your money at the end of the day. So if you're unhappy yeah. with the way that it's being spent, you should say something. And if you don't say anything, it will be assumed that you're happy with it. Um, but one of the things that's really important to note, and, and it builds on to the previous points um, we were talking about with policy, policy certainty, is that the South African National Treasury has recently released its paper on financing a sustainable future, in which it outlines its policy positions on a range of things from the just transition to sustainable development goals, the role of capital markets, the need for green finance taxonomies. Um, so I, uh, in essence, you know, criteria that projects should meet in order for them to be called sustainable. So they've produced all of this. They put a lot of thinking into it. It took them a couple of years to really come up with their positions. And right now, there are working groups that have been established that are working on how to make that implementable. How do we turn that from policy position into practice? And one of the things that they're working on and with uh, that the PRI is actually involved in is a capacity and competency work stream, which is to say, for the uh, level of investors, but then also directors on boards, what are the competencies and the capacities that they need in order to make the right decisions when it comes to sustainability issues? So there's a, an initiative right now to sort of say, okay, well, you want to be a leader, a corporate leader in this market. We have, as a country, specific objectives that we're trying to achieve. If you want to lead, you need to understand those things. You need to be competent be able to really talk the talk and walk the walk. So it's very exciting. These things are happening. Um, but like I said, that's on one angle. And then Taryn's point is absolutely right that they also need to get pressure from the asset owners, from the clients at the end of the day to make sure that they are continuously being pushed to grow and develop. Um, from Shonin, an interesting question saying, 
what about small and medium-sized enterprises? I guess, are they regarded as building a more sustainable economy? And who is it that should be supporting them? I mean, her particular issue is about a company that um, I think has canceled contracts or is not making good in a contract. But let's talk generally about the role of small and medium-sized enterprises. Is it possible for them to uh, implement these kinds of principles? Or does it really require big corporates, big asset managers, et cetera? And either of you could take that question. Um, I'm happy to, to kick it off and then Taryn can add uh, yeah. from the investor okay. perspective. I know that you know all the research shows that small and medium enterprises are critical for job creation in emerging markets. Mm. Um, they're very important for that. What's also very interesting is that increasingly we're seeing investors of all sizes, so institutional investors, high net worth individuals, family offices, are increasingly interested in impactful investment. Mm. They want to be able to make an investment that not only generates a financial return, but also has some sort of social or environmental impact. And we're seeing increasingly that the investors looking for that kind of investment project are looking at the alternative asset classes. So they're looking at private equity deals and they're open then to more small and medium inter uh, enterprises. So they're not just looking at the big listers. And they're yes. doing that because then they usually get a seat on a board as an investor, they get to be part of the decision making, their oh. values and ethics get to be part of that decision. And usually those companies are more uh, connected to local communities, so their impact is proportionately greater. Um, so we're seeing a, a lot of interest, even from big institutional investors, in increasing their allocation to that asset class. Um, when it comes to, you know, how do you follow these principles? Is it just for the big guys? Absolutely not. Um, what, what varies? You know, the size of a business and its function um, vary considerably from business to business. But the purpose of a corporation and the principles of running a corporation in a sustainable fashion are constant. Those Thank don't you. change. Thank you. Um, so, Taryn, I want to move a little bit back to COVID. Um, this week I've been le reading a lot about how people are waiting very long time to get the test results back and that's because there aren't enough reagents there are enough testing kits but not enough of the the chemicals that you need to get results back um early in the process we saw how very difficult it was to buy um to even buy masks on in the global um, health equipment uh, marketplace um and then of course there's the whole vaccine nationalism and if you read earlier this week, the U.S. has bought out the world stocks on remdesivir, one of the ARV drugs, which is which has some potential in, in making COVID more manageable. So here you say in your notes that how to make the economy more sustainable is a practical example. We have to localize. So you've seen clothing retailers, producers who are investing in localizing supply chain which, are, which which means that we'll be less reliant on imported clothing, for example, better able to plant stock levels. But I think this moment also shows us why it's important to have these shortened supply chains. Eh? Absolutely. And what we're seeing is that these factors that typically mitigate environmental related risks, yes. so optimizing consumption, localizing supply chains, they actually put us in a better position to kind of deal with the next virus pandemic as well, because we have yes. that, that, that building of kind of corporate resilience, but it also it means that the agricultural intensity, that infringement of planetary boundaries is not nearly as intense. It can be done in a much more sustainable way. And so that interconnectedness between the factors that mitigate environmental risk equally, building corporate sustainability, as well as mitigating the risk for further pandemics is something that's becoming apparent during this crisis. But I can imagine that for asset managers, that's a big call because sometimes it might be more expensive and a little less profitable um, to 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 build those local man that local manufacturing mm -hmm. expertise, um, mm -hmm. even to invest in the vaccines. Now we've seen we need much more probably pharmaceutical manufacturing capability. Do you think mm -hmm. that um, asset managers are, are able to take that long term perspective? Yeah, so it's it's not so much of a call as just okay. an observation that we're seeing in the companies that um, demonstrate significant levels of resilience during this time. And it comes back to the point of balancing short term versus long term. Yes. So while there might be an increase in input costs, costs in the short term, the longer term sustainability of the business, the resilience of businesses where they aren't as prone to global supply chain disruptions, 
um, certainly would be superior. So it's something that we monitor. It's not necessarily, it's not going to work for every business model. Um, sure. And it's a bal- and it's a balancing act. It's a balancing act between kind of returns um, and environmental, social, and governance factors. And similarly, on our side, in terms of the short-term response versus what the longer-term response needs mm. to look like. But I was really interested in your notes to read that keeping to those ESG um, environmental, social, governance goals um, doesn't is not necessarily always at odds with good value creation or profits. Let's be frank. Huh? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and it's it's what comes with taking a broader view of risk and return and how the definition of kind of sustainability, which is really what um, environmental, social and governance factors focused on, has kind of morphed into resilience. So having companies that have kind of a really strong governance who are able to build these good contingency plans so that yes. if members of their staff become sick, they can decontaminate a factory very quickly. They can mobilize resources to keep the production chains going. They're able to increase the levels of um, inventory, for example, to to kind of build up inventories to deal with disruptions. Those are factors that have typically been seen as kind of social related factors, but increasingly are important for resilience. And that's what we really look for in the companies that we invest in. What does a resilient company look like? Are they able to withstand this crisis and the next crisis and still create value? Anything that, um, can you name a few which which for you have done very well through this or would you rather not? I, I prefer not to. Um, okay, no, that's um, fine, yeah, that's if that's okay. Yeah. But we have lots of lack of questions. So I'll, I'll just move mm-hmm. on to that and then you can share them among you. So, from Ulrich Meyer Hollings, what is the thinking around investing in companies which may have very small salary gaps between leadership and staff, don't avoid tax, taxation by, in, by going to tax havens, and create, very, create well paid jobs? Lovely question. Maxine Gray, why do you have to wait three years for those drastic measures if we know they will be if, if we know that they will catalyze the change that is needed um i saw another question here which is oh it's it sounds good but it's fine this cry you can't see governments uh, implementing that i'm just trying to look for it but if you'd like to give a shot to to those questions um nicole or tan nicole you want to go first sure okay there are, there are a few in there so yeah. <laughs> just so what pops to mind so what is the thinking on investing and in what's essentially described as a good company probably yeah. a good idea uh, okay. to invest in that kind of company uh, that's pretty straightforward and then about the sort of w- why we have to wait so long and, and it's yeah. seeming a little bit pie in the sky okay so unfortunately some of the big policy and regulatory changes that we're talking about some of these big shifts do take time. Policy and regulatory development takes time. It's usually in spurts. So when there's a time of crisis, there'll be a raft of regulation, policy reforms that come through. And then that's followed most often by a period of consolidation and sort of um, reflection to see how is it going, what's been the impact. And that's how, how the policy and regulatory cycle works. And that's in theory, if everything is working as it should. So obviously, if it's scuppered by things like corruption or interference, yes. you get a whole different set of results, right? So it does take a little bit of time. The market, unfortunately, tends to work a bit quicker. Um, so response by the market generally is quite reflexive. It's about expectations, about future profitability, where's the next big uh, opportunity, right, to make money. Um, And the, you know, I'm an economist by training, so I am biased and I do genuinely believe that the market will work effectively, it effectively allocates resources when things are priced correctly. To date, we haven't been effectively pricing these environmental and social objectives. We've been leaving them out of the model. We've been calling them externalities and saying they're somebody else's problem. Now we're realizing that our equations are incomplete and that the way that we're making our investment decisions is with blinders on. And so we're introducing unnecessary risk into our portfolios. And as we are getting more data and more tools and resources and a better understanding and this shift in perspective and attitude, we're increasingly including these factors in the decisions and the markets are reacting appropriately. We're seeing this in the mass divestment movements away from fossil fuels in markets where now at this moment as we speak, in more than two thirds of the global market, uh, renewables are cheaper than fossil fuel for energy production. We're seeing the market recognize that and shift. 
because we've got the prices in place, we know. So the market moves much more quickly. So when we say, you know, we're taking so long to get these things going, it's usually because the market is being hindered in some way by maybe a policy or a regulatory blockage, like Karen was mentioning earlier with the IPP examples. That can create a problem. So that's why it's so important to have policy and regulatory environments that are conducive to responsible investment to the free flow of these kinds of things. Um, but then also because uh, it can be interfered with. But when it, when we talk about how oh it's a, the pie in the sky thing, uh, I would argue that it's not. It's it's good to have ambitions and targets and ultimate objectives. It's good to have something to aim at. And uh, when it comes to things like climate change or climate emergency and the Paris Agreement targets and things like the Sustainable Development Goals, those are not nice to have. Those are necessary. If we don't do that, that's the end. If you know, if we don't get the climate emergency, if we don't get climate change under control, that's it. So, and I firmly believe that we will figure this out because we have to. Just like with the COVID pandemic, we figured out a way to work through this as a global economy, we figured out a way to literally cease economic production in a whole massive uh, slew of sectors without everything coming to a complete standstill. We figured it out because we had to. And the same is true for this climate emergency and for the transition to low carbon economies. We have to do it and so we will, but the longer we wait, the more difficult it's gonna be. So the earlier we start, the better. And it starts with these conversations like this with you know, everyday, uh, citizens and investors, public policymakers coming together to say, look, how do we do this together? And I saw one of the comments was about, oh, but this is going to require sort of, co uh, you know, co um, a coherent effort and we don't have the capacity for that. We absolutely do. We've done it before with sort of great challenges. In this country is a great example um, of how you can change a system that's not working if everybody says it doesn't work for them. And we have to just do that again. And continue to do that and push. Thank you. So here's an interesting one for you, Taryn, from Ulrich Meyer Hollings. In my view, the vast majority of ESG type investment should go into non JSE listed small and medium sized enterprises, which are the most sustainable uh, job creators. But I want to add to that that obviously, with the trend towards delisting and so much more uh, going, so much private equity beginning to play such a very big part. Um, of, of, of our markets and unlisted companies really becoming much bigger. What's your view on that, Taryn? Yeah, so certainly, I mean, the, we have a significant amount of unlisted investments across private equity and unlisted yes. credit. And in those investments, we work very closely with these small, medium-sized businesses. And I want to touch on a point that Nicole had yes. mentioned, and it was around timescales um, and kind of the time periods in which we want to see changes. And we, the journey that we often walk, walk with these small and medium enterprises is that we start with small investments and we recognize that the institutional capacity may not be there. You're not going to have necessarily a fully comprised independent board, but it's a journey. And that's part of the journey of being a responsible fund yes. is walking along, alongside those counterparties that you invest in. So certainly from our side, we do see a significant amount of impact and our ability to influence is significantly enhanced on the understood side. As Nicole mentioned, the ability to sit on boards, the ability to negotiate legal agreements that are very clearly linked um, to sustainability outcomes or enhanced governance. The fact that if your board of directors and your risk control framework becomes more robust, potentially reduce pricing. And so we have the ability to certainly have a greater influence um, in the unlisted side and we, and we take that responsibility very seriously. But on the listed side equally, th this is really where the bulk of pension fund assets could potentially be allocated. And so it's an important area to continue to keep the standards of engagement high and to set the precedent because ultimately, although there's two separate markets, there's a listed market and there's an unlisted market, we often see trends in the listed market entrench what is allowed to happen in the unlisted market. So it makes it very hard to hold your unlisted borrowers to a higher standard of accountability than you hold much larger corporates. So it's really important to be consistent between the two markets and, 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 and uphold those standards, um, regardless of the type of business that you look at. The way that it manifests might look different. Yes. The timeframes could look very different. The ask could be very different from a large listed company versus a small and medium um, enterprise and a property developer. But I think as long as the direction of travel is appropriate, it's important to work in both markets. 
Thank you. That's great. So I'm going to read something quite long, but it's really interesting from Chad Capon. I don't know if you both know him or if I'm pronouncing the name correctly. For people asking about the returns on non-ESG funds in the US in the first quarter of 2020, seven out of 10 sustainable equity funds finished in the top halves of Morningstar categories and 24 out of 26 environmental, social and governance titled index funds outperformed their closest conventional counterparts he goes on is that a pattern that we are seeing in south africa and the rest of africa as well taryn or nicole either mm -hmm. of you so i'll i'll venture an answer Thank and you. nicole can always elaborate so certainly we're seeing the the trend more so globally but i think locally we are starting to see the early stages of that of kind of the response to the pandemic and the corporate resilience, corporate sustainability, becoming an increasingly important element of reputational risk. And so, for example, we had issues in the very early stages of lockdown with Diskem being accused of price gouging, um, which, was, which was settled um, separately. Um, but those type of reputational issues certainly are going to be affecting um, the way that institutional investors and certainly asset owners think about asset allocation. And I think it's inevitable that we see this broader kind of stakeholder concept um, yes. really take root during this, this pandemic. So it's not just about what are the financial metrics or the possible returns that an investment yields me, um, but how do they actually treat surrounding communities? Um, and that certainly is a theme that, that will gain traction. Um, I think the global trends around just as the asset allocation to ESG type investments and the untapped demand, and as asset owners increasingly ask for this type of investment, I think there are significant opportunities in this area and that it will become increasingly important like we've seen mm -hmm. with other trends with COVID-19, it's an acceleration of what we were experiencing before. Digitization, mm -hmm. um, environmental, social and governance factors, um, all of those things are just happening at hyperspeed. Okay, thank you. Um, so Nicole, do you, do you want to venture a thought on that? Or could you want to venture a thought on that? And then I want to come to a great question from Lisa Wannell. Huh? Just a quick uh, response sure. there. Thank yeah, you. Just a, a quick one, I'll tell you that yes. um, absolutely uh, all the evidence globally, not just in South Africa, but globally shows that companies that effectively integrate material environmental social governance issues into mm. their operations outperform financially. There's no doubt about that. And in South Africa, we've seen that with some of our ESG, even in the passive uh, investing. So you see it in this, in the active and in the passive. Um, I think the global trend we've seen with the outperformance um, has been a little bit related as well to what happened with oil because a lot of this sort of ESG or sustainable yeah. funds would have been away from fossil fuels. Um, so it might be a little bit exaggerated. The, the jury is still out, out on that one. But I definitely think, you know, the, the general trend is that, and it makes sense, it's an intuitive approach to investing, is that if you are taking better account of these risks, you will mitigate the downside. And if you're more accurately uh, um, identifying opportunities, you'll generate greater upside. So there is... This, this idea that somehow by integrating ESG or being a responsible investor, you would somehow have to forego returns has been absolutely debunked time and time again over multiple decades now. Thank you. So, when so I've, so I've really learned from from you guys from our chats before and now is I always thought like okay I've got my retirement annuities and other investments but there's really no way that I can influence this and then early on the call you said to me actually you can so I was wondering if you would step by step for those of us who are in a similar boat to me um, we got a question from one of our members here who's saying um, do you think that you're going to see a world of greater shareholder activism um, are in a post-COVID economy and world. I don't know when post is going to be because I heard <laughs> Professor Slim Abdul Karim saying we're in for a number of peaks and no Cape Town, is, Western Cape isn't at the plateau. But do you feel hopeful, Taryn, about shareholder activism? And if you could just tell me how to be one. <laughs> <laughs> sure thing. So certainly, I mean, as an asset owner, there's a number of routes and there's a number of questions you could ask. So if you've got a financial advisor, certainly reach out to that financial advisor and start the conversation around who's managing my money, 
how can I understand the approach to responsible investing? What is the literature that I can read? Because it's certainly right. an, an over, the onus is on self-education as well. Um, if you are a retail investor, I'd go to your asset manager's website, understand their positions on key issues, understand their policies, and then have a look at your fact sheets. You, receive, you would receive a fact sheet either monthly or quarterly as a retail investor, and have a look at what the top 10 holdings are. Um, and the thing that's really important to state with responsible investing is that it's not a one-size-fits-all. So okay. you could have managers say uh, and that follow responsible investing principles, but have their portfolio holdings look totally different. And so it's not to say that because I'm a responsible investor, I'm not going to have any exposure to mining companies, for example. You might find that there are going to be mining companies where managers have assessed the risks and the mitigants and the pricing critically and assess that it's still an appropriate investment, that they're okay. comfortable with the long-term strategies. Mm -hmm. So it's really about educating yourself, going through the literature, and then asking the questions. So the type of questions that you could ask um, is, do you have a policy on responsible investing? What does it look like? Okay. How have you evolved the definition of responsible investing? Talk me through some recent examples of responsible investing or in environmental, social and governance risk factors in action. How might I see it, how might I see it reflected in your portfolio exposures? Um, it's really about Edu like that base level of education to enable a continuing dialogue. And some of that dialogue can happen directly with your financial manager, your financial advisor. Some of it is just through learning through the correspondence that you receive with your asset manager um, and attending investor days. Often these asset managers um, have retail um, investor days. So it's about showing up, using your voice, um, and then owning your power, I think. And I think as we really are grappling with this interconnectedness and the sense that you know the actions that I take have ripple effects in the communities yes. in my in my community in my country and in the globe. How do I hold myself to a higher level of accountability? And so I do think that we're going to see increasing shareholder activism. We've seen it come through um, kind of in the Black Lives Matters movement, um, in a yes. host of other issues where people have had enough and they're starting to speak up. And so it really feels like a special moment in time where we've got this confluence of forces um, and things that we can't unsee. So these issues of kind of social inequality, um, which have only really been exacerbated during this COVID crisis, it's really becomes too hard to look away. And so I do think that we're going to be seeing a lot more activism and people recognizing that the power that they, that they have, the power of their voice, and using that um, in a constructive way. Hmm. Thank you very much. That's really good guidance for me and I'm sure for many of us. Nicole, you want to have a go at how we can each be a uh, shareholder activist or, or even take it more broadly than that? Yeah, I would love to. I think, I mean, Taryn makes great points. There's not very much I can add to her, but I, I would say that the movement, and it links to that earlier question we had about rethinking the model of capitalism, and, and that has been happening, and we're moving away from shareholder capitalism, capitalism towards stakeholder capitalism. So I would like to see not just shareholder activism, but stakeholder activism. You don't have to own shares uh, in a company to have an opinion about how it operates, or with a financial advisor to have a problem with the way that it invests. Mm -hmm. And you have that voice. Um, I think on the shareholder side, though, one of the things that we need to do as sort of everyday South Africans, Africans that are working, in, you know, if you are fortunate enough, privileged enough to be in a position to have a long term investment of some kind, own that and accept the fact that is your money. If, you know, it's not future growth money, it's mine that they are managing on my behalf. So they work for me. So that, you know, don't, don't, um, Give away your power to somebody just because you're not a CFA, um, mm. because that's really a coward's way out and, and you're going to regret it in the long term. Mm. And if you don't have a long term investment, but you are invested in the long term in the functioning of this economy, as all of us are, then use that voice. So now, for example, when we're talking about how do we recover from the pandemic, be part yes. of those conversations when there's a call for comment, have, a, have an opinion. You know, if there's something happening in your local or your municipal uh, developments that you feel like you should weigh in on, then do that. Use the platforms that are at your disposal. Engage with, you know, the media is a really important stakeholder in getting these kinds of discussions going. Engage, write a letter, um, have a conversation, start small and build up. I really do think grassroots movements work. Um, mm -hmm. But it all starts with, like Taryn said, you've got to educate yourself so that you're asking the right questions.
that's really very inspiring i'm sure not only to me but to many of us the guide on how to do it so i'm just going to get to a few questions because there's many and also lack of comments okay the positive results of outperformance is an important factor to bring about change that's from um mary jane marlon burgess the sa economy was in trouble before the COVID pandemic pandemic arrived we know it was in recession mm -hmm. south africa should pivot towards holistic ndp that's national development plan project that in, incorporate um, the ESG goals and again that's environment social and governance modeling the keys to partner with the private sector how can we as citizens advocate and I think you've begun to answer that um, for from Dirk Oesthuizen and I've seen this a number of times just to keep it in your heads is there a concern about greenwashing of investment mm -hmm. cases ESG washing was another question from Luyanda Mohatle. In continuing to promote responsible investing, how does future growth ensure its counterparties are not only mindful of being socially responsible corporate citizens, but also engaging the strategies you spoke about so it doesn't just be, end up being a box ticking exercise? A similar range of questions. And then a last one, because I do want to get them onto our agenda, or at least show they've been in heard. So you're essentially talking about nature for people, pricing and valuing to reflect the value of nature for people. This is great and critical, but in reality, what checks and balances are in place to make sure um, that responsible investing um, is, is, is in fact responsible. Similar theme coming across um, from all of those. If you could have a crack at it as we begin to wind up. Huh? A sure. lot there. <laughs> I'll be my yeah. There are definitely some specific ones in yes, there for yes. Terence. I'll, I'll request and I'll hand over to her. And that is okay. focusing on this issue of greenwashing and how do we make sure that responsible investment yes. is actually responsible. And that's a really critical issue. Accountability is core to this, right? It doesn't help to have all the principles in place if nobody's checking enforcement. And so on a global level and locally, there's a lot happening on that front. So globally, we're seeing the development of what are called green finance taxonomies, which is essentially a list of criteria that a project needs to meet, a project or a fund or a, um, an investment product has to meet if it wants to call itself green or sustainable or responsible. We've seen way too many things marketed as, as such without anyone checking it, right? Um, if you see, uh, you see the same thing in uh, people that were marketing things as healthy, right? Everything was marketed as healthy at one point until the regulators. Until you look at the, um, we need to look at the yes. this product, right? So that's what's happening now. There's a global movement toward that. And the FSCA in South Africa, the regulator is currently working on developing such a taxonomy. So the idea would be to say, okay, you want to call a project green? then it needs to meet these criteria. And the, the reason that we develop those is not just so that things can't be uh, greenwashed, but because we have these ultimate targets as part of the Paris Agreement to say, in order for us to meet that, a certain percentage of our investment needs to be green. Okay. And in order for us to know, we have to def define it. So that's one of the things that's happening. And we're seeing you know, things like increasing disclosure uh, on what you're doing, not just the activities, but the outcomes of those is very important to ensuring that you're not just playing lip service to the whole thing. And I think that's where the accountability comes in. And if you're reading those reports, if you're the intended audience, which you are as a client or as the general public sure. reading an annual report, you need to question those and say, but you haven't actually said what you've achieved here mm. um, or why it matters. So, that's so it does that. demand some commitment from us, like give up on some of the Netflix and read all those documents that come your way, <laughs> I guess. So, Taryn, want to have a crack at that range of questions yeah. all on a similar sure. theme? Yeah. So I think at the heart of the questions really is how do we know if you're truly being a responsible investor or yep. if you're just saying that you're one? Um, and sometimes I find it helpful to kind of invert the question. So what would an irresponsible investor look like, right? So to me, an irresponsible investor would have a very narrow one-dimensional view uh, form of investment decision making. Um, and it doesn't demonstrate the appropriate levels of skepticism or accountability. And it also fails to look holistically at the knock-on effects of this particular investment. And so kind of with that context in mind and thinking about avoiding box ticking and window dressing and all these things, what's really important, and when you ultimately buy an investment product, what you're buying is your asset manager's process. So it's the way they go about making these investment decisions. So it's so critical to understand exactly how that gets done. 
do you do the analytical team actually spend time with the management teams understanding the business kicking the tires so that it's not just a desktop exercise the level and depth of engagement the follow-up questions that are asked you know how that actually influences either the size of the loan we work in the credit space or so the size of the loan that's offered the, the term of the loan um, or the price at which that loan is offered and so it's seeing the way that it actually reflects in your portfolio holdings and as nicole mentioned it's the outcomes right and so we want to we want to measure outcomes we don't invest for outcomes we invest because the investment merits stack up um, and they also happen to have good social outcomes and so it's about understanding the outcomes over time and it's tracking so your comment around kind of taking the time to read the reports one of the key things that we do and what's such a big focus area for us is actually comparing performance against targets so that's a simple thing that you can do to say this was my target for developmental impact that i wanted to reach this is what i signed up to when i bought this product what have you actually delivered? Um, and similarly, when you look at a set of financial statements, there's a host of targets around environmental compliance. And it's interesting to see the trend over time. So um, a lot of these, these ESG or environmental social governance issues, they can be slow moving. And it's important to look at the movie, not just the scene that you see in front of you. So it's building that, that kind of mosaic, that bigger picture that really helps you understand whether this is truly a responsible investment. Thank you. I hope that got answers it. the question. Yeah. I think it does. So we've got many more, but we've got to run. So last one and very, very quick answers. We literally have a minute. So if Arundhati Roy says that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew, let's take a short look. In a year's time, what would what would make you happy to see? What would make you hopeful um, given our conversation today? Nicole, you want to go first? Yeah, in a year from now, I'd like to see the South African Green Finance Taxonomy along with a reworked uh, integrated resource plan that is focused on renewables, uh, preferably locally sourced. Excellent. So from your mouth to Gwede Mantash's ears. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> now, Taryn, over to you. Yeah, certainly in a year's time, I'd, I'd really like to see greater levels of awareness and education around responsible investing um, and asset owners really taking up their responsibility and their seat at the table um, in kind of demanding a different way of investing for this new normal. Thank you very much. Thank you to you both. Have lovely weekends. Nicole Martin and Tan Sanka, you've really taught me a lot. And to our audience who joined us on a Friday afternoon, I do hope you have peaceful um, and safe weekends. Um, thank you so much. Bye-bye.